Uh, hello, friends and neighbors. Dr. Ken Berry here with you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a family physician. I've been practicing family medicine for over 22 years now, uninterrupted. Graduated medical school in the year 2000. So I'm going to be hanging out with you for the next little bit. We are going to be talking about some controversial things in this hour. Um, starting off, I'm going to let you know that I was blocked uh, sometime in the recent past by a very important account on Twitter. I did not realize that I was blocked by this very large account uh, until I, I did some digging and I found out that do you know, can you guess who blocked me on Twitter? I was going to, there's a recent article, uh, there's already been multiple articles about this product containing glyphosate. And now it turns out that it actually is very high in levels of another side, herbicide, pesticide, fungicide, all those types of things that, you know, you, you prefer not to put in your body. It turns out their product's very high in that as well. So I was going to... Uh, uh, tweet, retweet them and tag them in that. And I found out that I have been blocked by Cheerios. Yeah, the cereal. The cereal Cheerios has blocked me on Twitter. And so I don't, I'm not sure how I'm going to cope with that. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hanging out with my support animal and I'm, I'm going to contact my therapist uh, about that to see what I need to do so I can keep my sanity now that Cheerios has blocked me on Twitter. So uh, if you have questions about diet, weight loss, nutrition, getting rid of type 2 diabetes, getting rid of fatty liver, getting uh, inc improving your hypertension, uh, losing weight, we're going to be talking about all that stuff this hour. Uh, I'm going to be taking your questions so that you will be like, oh, okay, now I understand. Because very often, People are like, no, keto's dangerous. Ketovore, I never even heard of that. Carnivore diet, oh, that's for crazy people. Uh, but then after they ask a question and I answer it, they're like, oh, well, that makes good common sense. Maybe I'll give that a try. And so, as you know, uh, the majority of adults in the United States are metabolically unwell. The majority of adults in all modern societies whether you're talking about Japan, the Europe, whether you're talking about the Scandinavian countries, uh, even China, the majority of adults have at least one marker of metabolic syndrome. And so I want you to take uh, mouthy mama, grandma bear, dares advice and share this video right now on your favorite social media. That's how I reach new people. It could be, be very well be that, that you're watching this video. You know about my videos because somebody shared one of them with you. So to help the billion or two people who are suffering from metabolic syndrome all over the world, please share this video. That helps new people find out that, oh, my God, there is hope. Oh, my God, there is an easy, common sense, doable solution to get rid of my metabolic disease. And that's how you can help me. If I've helped you in some small way, that's how you can pay me back is by hitting the thumbs up or hitting the heart and sharing this video. That helps me reach new people who need to be reached because they need to be helped. All right, let's see what's going on here. Ah, here's a good one. Is berberine as effective as metformin? Great question. And so there's not as much research on this as I would like, but it makes sense that berberine is as effective as metformin because they're both made the same way. Uh, basically, metformin is a, a pharmaceutical strength berberine. And so, yeah, if you'd rather not support big pharma, and you would rather buy berberine, uh, I think it's probably going to give you almost as good a benefit. You want to buy a reputable brand. So if you're going to buy this off Amazon or one of the other big websites, you want to buy one that's got thousands of five-star reviews and also that is a brand name so that they have skin in the game. Why does it matter if they're, if they're a, a big brand name? 
So if you're buying some generic small brand berberine and you find out, oh, they've got, they put rat shit in there. You can post a review or whatever. They don't really care. They'll just change their name and go, go be another company. But if it's a huge brand, then they've got a reputation and they want to protect that reputation. And so they're going to go out of their way to do things like third party testing with random samples because they want their product to be good because they've got a brand name that they've got to protect. And so they don't want it to be something that's sketchy. All right. Oh, yeah, listen, <clears throat> great question. Now, I can tell this is a new person. Mad Nine Lin, has carnivore helped anyone with ulcerative colitis? Oh, Mad Madeline, you've come to the right place. Yes, the carnivore diet for anybody with ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, or any form, any version of irritable bowel disease or ir irritable bowel syndrome, carnivore is the way for you. Okay, many people with with ulcerative colitis get better on a ketogenic diet, right? That's mainly half your plate covered with fatty meat, half your plate with low carb veg. But for for some people with ulcerative colitis, they can achieve complete remission by removing all the plants from their diet, just eating a carnivore diet. Yeah, absolutely. In that, like I said, Crohn's disease, carnivore diet, irritable bowel disease carnivore diet, ulcerative colitis, carnivore diet. If you've got like a microscopic colitis, any kind of colitis, carnivore diet. And so what I'm recommending to you is not some weird fad diet. Uh, the anthropological evidence makes it very clear that human beings have been eating a diet composed predominantly of fatty red meat for millennia. Okay, now for the last two or 300 years, we haven't. For the last uh, few thousand years, in some cases we have, in some cases we haven't. But if you go back past 12 or 13,000 years, paleoanthropology, the research is very clear that we ate as much fatty red meat as we can get our hands on. And so <clears throat> in biology, there's this way of thinking about things. It's called an adaptation theory or adaptation hypothesis. What it means is, is that if a species has been eating something for a long damn time, as in tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, then they have become adapted to that. And it is good for them. And it actually is, it's uninflammatory. It's going to give them all the nutrition they need. That's the theory in biology. And so we can take my sheep over there grazing in the pasture as an example. What if there was an article that came out tomorrow on WebMD that said sheep shouldn't eat grass. They should, they should, you should feed them this highly processed. Oh, Insure has just come out with a new sheep shake. You need to feed your sheep this Insure sheep shake. They shouldn't eat grass. Everybody should be like, what? That's dumb. I'm not doing that. Sheep are meant to eat. They're made to eat grass. They have evolved eating grass. That's their that's their ancestral food. That's ancestrally appropriate. That's species specific to them. Well, the problem with human beings, Homo sapiens sapiens, is that we've forgotten what we are. We've forgotten where we came from, and so we're much we're very susceptible because of our big brains to fall for marketing, right? And so you see this AG1 green shake. Oh God, I've got to have AG1 uh, balance of nature. Oh my God, I've got to have that. No, all that stuff's dumb. Just as dumb as, as insure making a sheep shake for your sheep or a cow shake for your cows. That's eat lunacy. That's lunacy. And we've been so distracted, so misled for so many generations that were like, no, AG1 would never mislead me. Balance of Nature wouldn't mislead me. Kellogg's, they wouldn't mislead me. Uh, General Mills, po Cheerios would never mislead me. Come on, it's time for us all to grow up, okay? Even uh, armchair reading in, in paleoanthropology, you're going to be like, oh, so we should eat lots of fatty red meat. Mm-hmm, yes, you should. 
That's why it helps so much is that we're adapted to that. We've been eating that since we've been on this planet. Does that make sense? Tell me if I'm not making sense here, folks. Also, I want to know, oh, look, here's um, Noreen. She's watching from Yorkshire. See, in America, we call that Yorkshire, but I'm sure it's Yorkshire. As, as, as truncated and quick as you can say it, Yorkshire, England. Where are you watching from? What city? What state? What country? Tell me in the comments, just like Noreen did. Hello, Noreen. What is it like? Almost 8 o'clock there? PM? All right. Allison. Hey, Dr. Barry. I am keto, but I'm suffering from tennis elbow. I uh, have to be uh, careful taking anti-inflammatory meds. Yeah. So, this is another way we've been really misled. First of all, we think that even if, if we're, and I don't know how moderate or severe your pain is, Allison. I'm not talking about just specifically you. I'm trying to answer this so it'll help the most people out there. If Allison's tennis elbow, uh, epicondylitis, is mild, Allison shouldn't take anything for it. That's part of being alive is you're going to have a mild ache or pain every now and then. Okay. So, but we've been trained by, by the Tylenol company, the Aleve company, the Advil company. If you have any pain whatsoever, you need to get a pill out of your medicine cabinet right now. Take it. Take two and take it every four, six or eight hours. No, no. If, if, if Allison's epicondylitis is mild, she doesn't need to take anything for it. She needs to keep a heating pad on it as many hours in the day as she can. She needs to keep moving it through its full range of motion. And remember, the elbow is not just a hinge. There's also this involved, Allison. You need to do that and keep heat on it as many hours as you can. Ice is not your friend. Think about it. W what happens when you have an itis, when you sprain your knee, sprain your elbow? Does, does your body cool that area off? Or does your body heat that area up by increasing the blood supply? You ever had a sprained joint and you touch it and you're like, oh, it's hot. And we've been trained again by the uh, NSAID companies. Oh, you need to, yeah, that joint's hot. You need to take something for that. No, that's your body trying to help it heal quicker and heal completely. If you put ice on it and start taking Motrin every, every six or eight hours, you're going to actually lengthen the time it takes to heal. And you could very well set yourself up for a chronic joint pain, chronic joint problem with that. Heating pad, range of motion. And if you're having moderate to severe pain, Allison, then you take an anti-inflammatory for a few days until that pain is back down to mild to moderate. Then you stop taking anything. There are people that truly believe that, oh, if I take Advil, it'll help things, it'll help things heal quicker. The exact opposite is true. OK, all of the anti-inflammatories that you can get over the counter or from your doctor. So this includes Advil, Motrin, Aleve, uh, all of them. And then also Celebrex, Diclofenac, any kind of, of anti-inflammatory actually breaks the inflammatory chain, which is the first step in that joint getting better. That's that's the first step in the healing process. And you're literally going to take a pill every six or eight hours that that breaks the first step of the healing process. Does that make sense? Anti-inflammatories are fine. If you're having moderate to severe pain, it's fine to take ibuprofen, Motrin, Advil, Aleve, Naproxen for two or three days. As long as you take swallow it with a full glass of water, you don't want to get stuck in your esophagus. It'll call, cause an ulcer. And also with food, so it doesn't cause an ulcer in your stomach. Because all these anti-inflammatories, they'll cause ulcers if you don't take them properly. Does that make sense, Allison? I hope that helps. Hope that helps. All right. Let's see what's going on here. Joanna, can you discuss energy drops? Transition to carnivore six months ago. Great energy. Uh, a month after starting. Last two months, very low energy. So two things probably going on here, Joanna. The carnivore diet is so rich in protein and fat, which are the most satiating macronutrients. Carbohydrates don't satiate you at all. And so for some people, and it seems to be usually women, when they're eating a, a fatty meat carnivore diet, they get so satiated that they, they wind up accidentally under eating. They're like, well, I'm, I'm not really hungry. I'm full after just a small portion. 
But you have to remember, Joanna, your body's using that protein and, and fats, the healthy protein, healthy fats you're getting from animal foods. Your body's using that to build, to repair, to renew, to invigorate your whole body, including your brain and your immune system. You've got to eat until you're comfortably stuffed. Also, many, uh, usually women, again, have this little voice in their head saying, oh, that's too big of a portion. Don't eat that much. No, no. On a carnivore diet, you get to eat until you're comfortably stuffed. And you should eat until you're comfortably stuffed. Your body's trying to tell you if you're pushing away after a four ounce serving portion of salmon or a six ounce serving of very lean steak and you're still hungry, your body's saying, Joanna, honey, you, you haven't eaten enough. Eat more food. OK, make sure you're salting your food to taste. Human beings, just like all mammals on the planet, need salt. We need a daily supply of salt. Do not be afraid of salt. Then the third thing is that many people on a carnivore diet, as, as months go by, they tend for some reason to eat leaner and leaner cuts, and they don't add as much fat as they should. So the first thing, Joanna, find a local butcher. Hopefully you're buying your meat from a local rancher. <laughs> Tell your butcher to stop trimming the fat off your meat. You want all the fat that comes with that meat, and you want to eat all that fat. You want to salt that meat to taste. And you want to eat until you're comfortably stuffed. I think if you'll do all three of those things, you'll find that your energy returns and you feel even better than you were. Eniko, hello, Dr. Barry. My blood sugar level dropped very well in the first month of keto, uh, but now it has reached a plateau. I can't get under 150 milligrams per deciliter postprandial. So most doctors consider a postprandial, meaning after you eat, an hour after you eat. If your blood sugar doesn't get up above 140, we consider that normal. So you're almost there, Eniko. Uh, what I would say is let's let's make your keto diet a little more keto by bumping up the fat and bumping down the carbs a little more. And then also I want you, Eniko, and everybody who's using keto, keto or carnivore, I want you to check your hemoglobin A1C every three months and you're fasting insulin every three months. Very often on keto, ketovore, carnivore, you'll still have blood sugars higher than you anticipated. Like I figured it'd be lower than this. But when you check your A1C and your fasting insulin, they're getting better and better and better. And that's the ultimate gauge that we go by, is that you're, you're becoming metabolically healthy, okay? Does that make sense? But another thing that happens to people on the ketogenic diet, it's one of the reasons that I, I'm coming more and more to just recommend go carnivore, is this thing called carbohydrate creep. You start out very strict, under 20 total grams a day. And then some people are misled by people trying to sell keto bars, keto shakes, saying, oh, you should count net carbs. You don't have to count total carbs. Uh, there's a technical term for that. It's, um, what is that term, Nisha? Oh, yeah, bullshit. Horseshit. Yeah, that's not true. You need to count total carbs and keep them under 20 total grams a day. Now, uh, and Nico might be saying, crap, I've been counting net carbs. That's the, that's the problem, and Nico. Under 20 total grams of carbs a day. And so carb creep is when you've been eating keto for a while and you're like, well, I saw this keto bread at the store. It says keto on the label. And sure, that's that's got to be like legally. It's got to be keto, right? No. Okay. No, no, that's a marketing ploy. Remember we talked earlier about marketing. Their job as marketers is to make money for the company. It's not to improve your health at all. They will put any crap they can in there, the cheapest crap they can, so they can make the most profit. And they'll put keto. I'm surprised there's not keto toilet paper already. Oh, I only wiped my butt with keto toilet paper. And I'm, I, I'm not losing weight, though. I don't understand why. Okay, keto has a definition. It's real food, whole food, one ingredient foods, under 20 total grams of carbohydrates daily. That's what keto is. So if any of if you're like, oh, I didn't know that part, that's what's going on. Okay, thanks for the question. Hey, Holly Crazy, how you doing, old friend? Edna, Edna says, my brother is 35 years old, uh, hypertension, cardiomyopathy for 10 years. 
how to start keto carnivore from standard diet without worsening on um, on bisoprolol and ramipril, low ejection fraction, less than 40. That's a little low. How could keto carnivore help his heart? So there's several studies in the literature, Edna, that show that the heart muscle contracts better. The heart runs better on ketones than it does on sugar. Ketones and fatty acids are the preferred fuel for the human heart muscle. I can't tell you how many thousands of people who had some degree of heart failure or cardiomyopathy when they go keto and they, they're in ketosis for the majority of the day. They're like, my ejection fraction got so much better. I Now I can go up the stairs without getting short of breath. I can go for a walk without getting short of breath. Your heart prefers ketone. And that should tell you something. Okay. So I would, over the next month or two, Edna, I would just help him slowly convert over to either keto or carnivore, whichever one he likes the sound of best. If he loves veg, we'll do keto. If he just loves meat and doesn't would never miss vegetables, then carnivore. There you go. And then after three months on either strict keto or strict carnivore, go back to the cardiologist and, and have an echocardiogram repeated and see what his ejection fraction is. But you'll be able to see it in him. He'll he'll just be healthier. He'll feel better. He'll have more energy. He won't get short of breath so easily. His heart's going to beat better. Absolutely. Absolutely. Edna's part of our private group. Uh, if you guys are in the private group, you don't have to do super chats. You know I'm going to answer your questions in the lives we do inside the private group. Uh, if any of you guys want to join our private group, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you, Edna. Uh, thank you very much, Holly. Holly says, I have HOCM. I'm told it's genetic, but have you known of carnivore helping that condition at all? I'm 23 days in and going strong. So what we have heard from, from people with HOCM and other kind of rare genetic disorders is that the symptoms get less severe on carnivore. They have flare-ups less often on carnivore. This goes for all the autoimmune conditions. Uh, we're even getting an increasing amount of feedback from people with multiple sclerosis, MS. They have documented MS with white matter lesions on their MRI of the brain. When they go carnivore and stay carnivore, their symptoms get less severe. They have they have slower progression. And we've even had a couple a couple of cases now where the lesions that were visible on the MRI went away after six to 12 months on carnivore. Now, I don't have an explanation for that, but all I know is we've got the before and after MRIs. So you make of that what you will. Uh, that This is the reason why more and more researchers are becoming more and more interested in a ketogenic diet. And so carnivore is a subset of a ketogenic diet. It's just lower in carbs. You've, you've cranked down the carbohydrate intake knob to almost zero. That's what carnivore is. Okay. And if you go to clinicaltrials.gov and just type in the, the, the phrase keto, K-E-T-O, there's over 425 studies currently registered looking at keto for this condition, that condition. And every day you're going to see new, new research results published. Keto helps with this. Keto helps with that because it's part of a proper human diet. In order to eat a ketogenic diet, you've got to remove all of the worst slow poisons from the standard diet, the modern diet. You're going to remove all the sugar, all the added sugar for sure. You're going to remove all the grains, wheat, rice, oats, corn, all the other grains. You're going to get rid of those because they're too high in sugar, too high in carbs. You're going to get rid of all the vegetable seed oils like canola oil, soybean oil, peanut oil, safflower, sunflower. You're going to get rid of all that. And you're going to start using animal fats and you're going to start eating real food. For keto, it's going to be half your plate covered with fatty meat and eggs with the yolk, half your plate covered with veg, and then a few nuts, low carb nuts and a few low carb berries. That's keto. Ketovore is, is almost all meat. Maybe just a little tiny serving of veg and a few low carb nuts. That's ketovore. Carnivore is just meat and eggs. You can add seafood if you want, as long as it's cooked properly. No vegetable seed oils, no, no breading that comes from grains. That's carnivore. 
it's not some weird fad. It's just basically the food that, that turned us into the apex species that we are. You're just going back to eating the, the really old way. The original way. It's the original human diet. That's what, that's what keto, ketovore, carnivore are. Okay? You basically remove all the prisoner food, the grains and beans, and sugar and vegetable oils, all the cheap stuff that they want to make everything out of, you remove all that. And you remember, oh, that's for prisoners of war, prisoners or slaves. That's not for that's not for people like me. I'm supposed to eat real human food. And that's meat and eggs and seafood, plus or minus some veg, plus or minus some low carb nuts, plus or minus some low carb berries. That's a proper human diet. Thank you, Molly. Uh, ter tercia, tercia. Will having your tonsils removed affect your hormones and cause weight gain? No, uh, having your tonsils removed will affect your the the proper function of your immune system to some small degree, but I don't think it's going to affect your hormones uh, unless they really botched it and they they deemed the circulation to your thyroid gland, which is hard to do. Probably didn't happen. What's probably going on is you have an undiagnosed uh, hormone condition that's causing you to gain weight if you're if you're eating keto ketable carnivore. Uh, you need to have a full thyroid panel checked. You need to have your adrenal glands checked, sex hormones checked. Uh, and if you're like, well, what 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 labs do I need checked? I actually wrote a book about it with my good friend Kim Howerton, Common Sense Labs. There's a link down in the show notes if you want to get a copy. Brian, what is your opinion on sparkling water, plain, non-flavored, any negative effects? I, that's the only thing I drink. And I, when I can get it in glass, I do because I don't want any extra microplastics or nanoplastics. But all I could find was the plastic bottles this time. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of drinking water. Guess what humans drank 10,000 years ago? Guess what they drank 100,000 years ago? Guess what they drank? a million years ago, water. And if they found a naturally sparkling spring, they drank that water and probably loved it. But water, it could have been mud puddle water, could have been uh, stream water, lake water. It's hard to drink ocean water and do well. You have to, you have to do a, a couple of little things to it first. You're supposed to drink water. OK, now uh, there we we have element electrolyte powders. Uh, but I'm current, I'm more and more moving towards just putting the daily minerals from keto chow in my water. And we have a reverse osmosis unit under our sink. And so I use that to remove every bad thing from the water. But it also takes out the, the minerals as well. And then I use the daily mineral drops to just put the minerals back in the water. And, and so that gives it a little bit of a salty flavor. I got two uh, medicine droppers full of, of the daily mineral drops in this. And it's a little bit salty. And it's sparkly, and I freaking love it. That's what I drink on a daily basis. And I don't think there's any negative side effects from drinking sparkling water. You'll hear some people talk about the carbonation. Oh my God! No, come on, come on. That at worst, that's a that's a, a one tenth of one percent problem, minuscule, not a big deal. The main difference in your health is going to come by fixing your food, and then why when your food is fixed. Then you can start talking about other little things like this. But don't worry about this. This is a nothing burger. Meet Keto. Hey, Dr. B. Chansonette here in disguise as my YouTube channel. Ah, okay. Guess what? 107 day, 117 days into carnivore. I'm no longer pre-diabetic. My A1C is now 5.6 from a long time at 6.0, even on Ketovore. Thanks for your leadership. Love you guys so damn much. Thank you so much, uh, Chansonette. Uh, this is wonderful. I, di I didn't know you had a YouTube channel. I'll have to check that out. Uh, but so how many of you guys, how many of you, your A1C is not 5.6 right now? How many of you guys, your doctor said, oh, as long as we can get it around 6.5 or 7, that's fine. That's not fine. OK, when your A1C is 6.5 to 7, like most doctors say, that's well controlled. You are daily doing permanent damage to every organ in your body. Everyone, your eyes, your heart, 
your liver, your kidneys, uh, your sex organs, okay, you want an A1C of 5.6 or lower, just like Chance Annette has now. She's very proud of that, and you will be too when you get yours down there. Well done. Newbie, would cooking meat in a slow cooker or crock pot be a good way to cook it without cooking out too many uh, vitamins and uh, nutrients? Yes, absolutely, Newbie. Uh, human beings have been cooking meat for at least one million years. Remember the adaptation theory or hypothesis? Anytime a species has been doing something for a long damn time, and we've got good anthropological evidence that we've been cooking for at least one million years. Some researchers say maybe up to three million, but definitely for a million years we've been cooking our meat. Now, do you lose a little, a little bit of the vitamin content when you cook meat too much? Yes. Is it all gone? No. No. Uh, my good friend Bart K cooks his meat to death. He wants all his meat well done. And he's been eating that for a decade or more. He's He hasn't developed any vitamin deficiencies, okay? All the minerals in the meat, whether you cook it to death or not, are going to stay there because minerals are elements on the periodic table of the elements. You cannot get rid of them by cooking. <clears throat> uh, I try to cook my meat as little as I can. And very often, Misha and I will eat meat that most people feel like, oh, that's still mooing. But we like it that way. The vitamin content is a, a little bit higher that way. It's, it's not a huge deal. Uh, but if you're currently a well-done kind of person, let's try to make it medium well and get used to that. And then let's try to make it medium. I would love it if all you guys could slowly learn to never cook your meat more than medium. Okay, I think that's the sweet spot for flavor, but also to keep as much of the vitamin content as possible. But keep in mind, let me repeat, even if you cook it to death, there's still plenty of vitamins in it. Way more, uh, way more bioavailable vitamins in in well done steak than in the perfectly cooked plants. That's that's inarguable. Okay, but the longer you cook it, the less the vitamin content. That's for sure. It, especially at higher temperatures, you're going to break down some of the vitamins, but not me. So uh, yeah, slow cooker, crock pot. That's a great way. Especially, <clears throat> this is a great way to save money if money's tight in your house, and in many houses it is, then you want to buy cheaper, tougher cuts of meat. In no way are they less nutritious. They're just as nutritious as the more expensive cuts. Okay, But you can use a slow cooker or a pressure cooker or a crock pot, and you can cook them long enough that they're tender and delicious. And you don't get TMJ trying to chew up the tough meat. Yeah, absolutely. Jason, hey, Doc, how do you treat uncomplicated diverticula in the sigma and colon ver verified by CAT scan? I'm getting consistent pain. So if you're having pain, then they're not uncomplicated. You you have at least mild diverticulitis. Uh, if you took 1,000 adults just walking the streets in America with no symptoms and you did a, a CAT scan or an MRI or, or a colonoscopy, probably 60, 70% of them, they're going to have at least one diverticula, which is just an outpatching in the colon. And it comes from years of eating junk food. And, and even the, the best standard American diet is junk food. Even if your mama cooked home cooking every day, but it was the standard junk, it's junk. Sorry. And you're probably going to have some diverticuli. Okay. But what you don't want, what is dangerous is diverticulitis. When one of them gets inflamed or infected, and you start having pain, you can then also have fever and bleeding and other things. That's when it's a problem. And so as, as long as you have just have you have diverticulosis, meaning you have some diverticula, but they're not inflamed, that's irrelevant. Doesn't matter. It's only when they get inflamed is it a problem. Dawn, what are the pros and cons of the neti pot and the effects of daily nasal spray use? How to stop nasal spray? So many of the nasal sprays, prescription and over the counter, are steroids. That's how they work. Some are decongestants. That's how they work. Uh, your body can get used to either one of those, and and it almost you you're going to have a stopped up nose if you don't use the spray. Doesn't mean you have a deficiency of what's in the spray. It means your your body's gotten used to it. It's starting to use it as a crutch. 
I would recommend none of you guys use a prescription nasal spray every single day. Now, if you're currently not eating a proper human diet, you may need it. But after you've converted to either keto, keto, or carnivore, and you've stayed strictly on it for 90 days, I would recommend that you wean down, start using the spray every other day, then use it every third day and see if you can just stop it. Most people are happily surprised to go, huh, I don't even need that anymore because the inflammation in the body and also in their nasal pathogens is so much better. Okay, now neti pots. I personally hate the thought of a neti pot. I've never used one. I never will. I think it's it's not natural to squirt water up your nose. But with that being said, there are millions of people around the world that use neti pots and love them and swear by them. I don't, as long as you're using not tap water, because there's been some nasty infections that have actually gotten into people's brains from using just tap water in your neti pot. You want to use either distilled water or you want to boil the water first so that we don't have any any cysts in there. We don't have any eggs in there. We don't have any kind of thing that can that can develop into an infection. Okay, I, I think it's totally fine to use a neti pot, although I will never use a neti pot. Okay, it just doesn't seem right to me, but some people love them and I think they're fine. But the, the, all the steroid nasal sprays, you've got to, as you convert to a proper human diet, you've got to be weaning those down because they're not your friend. Misery's meat suit. My aunt is highly allergic to beef, seafood, and a ton of other things. Can she still do carnivore if ruminant meat isn't an option? So uh, there is no such thing as an allergy to beef unless you've been bitten by an alpha gal tick. A lot of people take the food sensitivity tests thinking that they are actually a real medical test. They're not. And they think, oh, I'm highly allergic to beef. And, oh, I'm highly allergic to seafood. No, no, you, you most assuredly are not. Now, some people have been bitten by a Lone Star Tick and they develop temporary alpha-gal, which means they can't eat the, the meat of mammals. But they can still eat seafood and all poultry just fine. And so some people... Even though they love ribeye, they're currently allergic to it, and they have to eat poultry and seafood and fish uh, and other things out of the sea. That uh, alpha gal is typically uh, three to twelve months, and then you can reintroduce mammal meat, and it's it's fine. I haven't seen anybody who's had alpha gal that persisted for many many years. It typically typically peters out after about a year or two, and then you can eat the meat of mammals, including ribeye, again. Uh, I would love to know why your aunt thinks that she's highly allergic to beef and highly allergic to seafood because the, it's it's virtually impossible for this to be true in a human being. Kenny, trying to increase eating fat on carnivore is just adding lard. Okay, yep, cook it in lard, and then you can actually use the lard along with some spices to make a nice tasty sauce to go on top of, of your food. Yeah, absolutely. Eating butter on its own makes me gag. Yeah, you don't have to do that. You don't have to eat the, the stick of butter like a candy bar. Uh, I can get tallow, but it has uh, an anti-foaming agent added to it, uh, dimethylpolysiloxin. Gotcha. And and that's such, it's such a tiny amount. I don't think that's a big deal. I've looked into that before. Uh, I wish they wouldn't add it. You don't have to add that, but some of them do. Um, but yeah, any animal fat is perfectly fine. You can use chicken fat, beef fat, pork fat, um, any of that, or butter. Yeah, any of that, any of that fat's fine. And a lot of people say, oh, well, that fat's just extra calories or empty calories, empty energy. That's complete and utter horseshit. Okay. All the animal fats have a long list of vitamins and minerals in them. They have a long list of fatty acids in them that your body needs, that your craves. Animal fat is not empty calories. Animal fat is not empty energy. That's, that's a myth. And I've heard doctors say this. I've heard registered dietitians say that sort of thing. And that's, they, they, they were taught that and they just believe it blindly without actually looking it up. You need animal fat in your diet. And yes, it's fine to put it on top when you're finished cooking. 
Kelton, sister had preeclampsia, is still running uh, 150 over 90, blood pressure three months later, uh, muscle spasms in legs, swollen ankles, body pain, depression, prediabetes, 100% of proper human diet. Uh, she needs to, uh, keto's fine if she likes veg, carnivore's fine if she doesn't like veg, okay? But it will help her blood pressure come down. It'll completely get rid of the prediabetes. The edema in her legs is coming most likely at this point, three months postpartum, it's coming from hyperinsulinemia. Every single one of these symptoms will get better, okay? And then the muscle spasms, muscle cramps, uh, she, she's, gonna, if she, she's gonna get magnesium and potassium from a proper human diet, but if she wants to add something like Element or Redmond's Relight, electrolyte powder, you can get an unflavored or there's electrolytes in the daily mineral drops. Not only are you getting all these minerals that, that are currently are not in most food because we've misfarmed our soil for a century or more, um, you, you can get the electrolytes along with all 100%, every single thing like this, everything she's got is gonna get better on a proper human diet, which can be keto, ketovore, or carnivore. And preeclampsia is something that I've heard a couple of researchers, they're thinking about doing a study. Preeclampsia is one of the things that I, pre I predict that when a, if a woman is eating a proper human diet before she gets pregnant and during pregnancy, the rate of preeclampsia will drop 90, 95%. It just almost won't exist anymore. Gestational diabetes will go completely, it just will be gone. It will, there won't be any such thing anymore. Gestational diabetes is just carbohydrate toxicity syndrome while pregnant. That's all gestational diabetes is. Preeclampsia is intimately related to hyperinsulinemia, which is caused by too many carbohydrates and chronic inappropriate inflammation. So being pregnant makes you more insulin resistant. That's absolutely true. And that's, that's a normal physiological change because you're trying to grow another human in your belly. So you need, anytime you're wanting to grow tissue, you want your insulin level to be higher. That's why when people who are not pregnant just eat too many carbs and keep their insulin too high for too long, that's why they get fat because it's a growth signal. But yeah, preeclampsia is one of the places when they do the, 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 uh, keto or carnivore study with preeclampsia, that's going to blow open Pandora's box because they're going to be like, uh, it's, it's virtually impossible for women to develop preeclampsia if they're eating keto or carnivore. It's like it just almost doesn't happen. I'm sure there'll be a few rare cases where it happens for, for some reason, but the vast majority of women with preeclampsia, if they would switch to a proper human diet, it'd be gone in a week or two. Gestational diabetes will be gone in a week or two. Yeah. Molly. Molly, 30 days lying diet to decrease inflammation overall better and feeling great, but still have inflammation, swollen joints, and pain in my hands. Would love uh, to intro new foods, but should I wait until all inflammation is gone? Yes, Molly. Uh, you've been doing it for 30 days. That's a huge victory. You know, already you're like, damn, I feel better, but it's not all gone. I would say at least 90 days, at least three months of lion diet and give your body the full 90 days to heal. Because I don't want you to have to eat the lion diet forever because that is, that feels a bit restrictive, but, uh, but you're going to get such health benefits. I think it's worth sticking with it for 90 days. Some people would say six months. You be the judge. There's no danger in being on the line diet for the rest of your life, but you might get tired of it. After that 90 days, your inflammation is going to be so much better. Then you can start to experiment. You can say, okay, I'm going to add back in my favorite food and see what happens. Your body will be so uninflamed, you'll get immediate feedback from your body. If that food needs to be on your red list, your stoplight list, as in, no, you shouldn't eat that food. You'll get immediate feedback. Or you'll get a little feedback if it's if it's a caution light, a yellow food, where it's like, eh, I feel like that flared up the inflammation a little. Or you'll have a long list of green light foods. You'll try it and be like, no, literally no inflammation at all. I can eat that. Yay, I love that. But I would do it for 90 days. 
Now, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to have to go in a few minutes, guys, because I've got a live interview inside of our private group. I'm interviewing Professor Ben Bickman. Yeah, that Ben Bickman that wrote the book, Why We Get Sick. The guy who spent his entire life researching, his entire professional career researching insulin, glucagon, glucose, diabetes, hypertension, all that stuff. Yeah, I'm, I've got him and he's the interview is only going to be in our private group where tribe members can ask Dr. Bickton, Bickman their questions. So instead of 2,300 people asking questions, there will be a couple of hundred. So we'll be able to get most all the tribe members answers, questions answered. So if that sounds like something you would like to be a part of, the link is in the show notes. Just You can join up right now. It's five bucks a month. That'll get you access to Professor Ben Bickman's private Q&A with tribe members only. One crafty gal, what are your thoughts on hypnotherapy for mental eating issues? I'm not opposed to. I think that I think that hypnosis is a real thing. Now, obviously, the you know when they get on stage and make you cluck like a chicken and all that that's that's bullshit, of course. But there are clinical uses for the hypnotic state. I think that's a real thing. I think the research has shown that to be a a a, a increased uh, uh, state of subject of sub, your sub, subject to suggestions. You're much more suggestive. Uh, now I'll tell you for mental, mental eating issues, a lot of people think their issue is mental and it turns out that when they go carnivore, whatever eating, uh, condition, this includes anorexia and bulimia and other disorder, uh, disorders of eating, they just seem seemingly go away. But yeah, I'm not opposed to hypnotherapy at all. Brandy, can cardiac events cause blood work numbers to be off? A hundred percent. Yes. Hubby's lab week, uh, one uh, hubby's labs, one week post 100% blockage to LAD, A1C and liver enzymes are up. Oh, 100%. Yes, yes. His blockage could absolutely be causing multiple labs to be abnormal. Yeah. That's why when somebody comes to the ER and chest pain, we check labs because we can actually detect the change in their different labs. And that's how we diagnose that something's going on because not everybody has classic symptoms. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, guys, I'm going to get one more question, then I'm going to switch over and do a live interview with Professor Ben Bickman, who wrote the book, Why We Get Sick. We're going to be talking about insulin, glucagon, losing weight, lowering blood pressure, reversing diabetes, and everything in between. Oh, and losing weight, of course. This is the address. If you go to phd.community, that's the website, and it's five bucks a month, sign up, and you can ask Professor Bickman, your questions. All right, let me get one more question here. We got that one. We got that one. Carnivore for the future. Vitamin D25 uh, got from 20 nanograms per milliliter to 104 nanograms by eating raw lard and raw meat for eight months. Remember earlier when I said that animal fats have vitamins in them? Carnivore for the future hasn't been taking a vitamin D supplement. They've just been eating lard. Lard, especially pasture, pastured pig lard, is rich in vitamin D and several other vitamins. Should I worry about that level? I don't think so. Down, uh, down 373 pounds with carnivore. Carnivore for the future is their, their uh, YouTube channel. One month at new work. Excellent. Excellent. I, I don't think so. I think if you get to 104, which many doctors would say, oh, you're vitamin D toxic. But it, now, so if, if you were taking a supplement, Carnivore for Future, I would say, yeah, let's cut back on the supplement 10 or 20 percent. Not stop it. Just cut back on it. But if you've got 104 from just eating real human food, huzzah. I think that's perfectly safe, perfectly fine. No danger whatsoever. I think the vitamin D levels are going to be a level that as more and more people go carnivore or meat heavy ketovore or meat heavy keto, we're going to have to look at a lot of the lab normal ranges with fresh eyes and say, because, you know, all the lab tests when they first came up with them back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 
they would just take a hundred random people who seemed to be in good health and they would draw their blood and see what their level was. Then they would set the normal distribution curve and standard deviations. That's how they came up with that normal range that's on your lab core sheet or your request sheet or whatever reference lab you use. That's where those came from. And typically you would think, oh, they probably check blood on 10,000 people. No, very often it's 150, 250 people. And that's what they set the normal range from. And that was people who were bread eaters, who were eating Crisco all the time, who were eating uh, grains and sugar all the time. So I think we're going to have to revisit a lot of the lab values. That's why in, in Common Sense Labs, we don't just have the normal range. We also have the optimal range because I think a lot of carnivores are going to really be moving into an optimal range. All right, guys, that is it for this. Please come over to our private tribe, become a tribe member, join our community so that you can ask Professor Ben Bickman your questions. I will post this, this uh, interview with him later on YouTube, but only PhD tribe members. See that? Proper human diet. They'll be the ones asking the questions today, not everyone else out there in the world. All right, guys, thanks for hanging out with me. I'll see you next time.